Kate, and I'm here to welcome everybody to our uh, webinar this morning. Our webinar is going to be about implementing standardized developmental screening in the patient and family-centered medical home. Before we get started with the presentation today, I'm just going to address a couple logistical issues. The first one is we have a growing number of people on the phone today, so everyone is on a global mute, so we won't be treated to anyone's cold music or their dog barking. We would love, however, to take your questions. So if you could type those into the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel, we would really appreciate it. Feel free to type them as they come, um, as they come to mind during the presentation today. We'll have a short time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So the more questions we have throughout that I can organize and get ready, the quicker we'll be able to get to those and answer as many of them as possible. So this webinar is um, hosted by the Patient Center Primary Care Institute, which was launched in 2012 as a public-private partnership between the Oregon Health Authority, the Northwest Health Foundation, and Quality Corps. The purpose of the institute is to offer a broad array of technical assistance to practices that are working towards the Patient Center Primary Care Home model of care and working on primary care transformation in general and to be an ongoing mechanism to support practice transformation and quality improvement more generally for practices in Oregon. Um, you can learn more about the Institute on our website, which we've linked on that last slide, and we'll remind you about again at the end of the presentation today. Um, the Institute works very closely with the Oregon Health Authority PCPCH program. Their model of care is a set of standards organized under six core attributes, which are up on the screen now. You can read more about the PCPCH program and the standards more specifically, including the 2014 standards that were just released at their website, primarycarehome.oregon.gov. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our presenters today. Sherry, are you ready to get us started? Yes, I am. All right. So I, will, I will go ahead and start. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today. I am a, a developmental behavioral pediatrician and the medical director for START. Uh, this work is, um, is quite a passion of mine. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to participate in this webinar and share um, what I feel like is very exciting information and strategies for better assuring that uh, no child enters kindergarten with an undetected developmental delay by use of the standardized screening in primary care. I'm also very pleased that uh, Dr. Gillespie will be joining us to share with us his perspective as a general pediatrician at the Children's Clinic and his involvement in his clinic's involvement in start and implementation of standardized screening as one of the original um, champions in this area. I also am quite delighted that Rosalia will be joining us. Uh, she is a parent of a young child and will be sharing with us her perspective of receiving standardized developmental screening for her son. And also with me today is Peg King, who is the START program manager and really the, the glue that keeps START moving forward. All right, so I'm trying to advance my slides, and it's not doing it. Let's see, what can I do? Just go ahead and try and click again, and you should be in business. Give it a second, because sometimes there's a short delay. OK. I haven't. I've clicked it what, probably way too many times, and, and it's not advancing. I click. Try clicking directly on the slide, and we'll try one more time. If not, we'll take over. but. Okay, I, I will click on the side. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, so this, All right, thank you. Uh, START is a project of the Oregon Pediatric Society, uh, which is the Oregon chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We are very um, delighted that we have sponsorship from the Ford Family Foundation, from the Kelly Foundation, uh, Project Launch, and Oregon Health Authority. And we work in collaboration with many statewide partners as well. So the goals and objectives today are to give an overview of standardized developmental screening and pediatric practices as recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, and as a metric for um, uh, 
primary care home, medical home, and uh, CCOs. It's also to improve the provider understanding, utilization, and implementation of the ages and stages uh, screening tool, which is a standardized developmental screening tool. It's to educate pediatric providers in proper documentation, coding, and billing of these screenings, and to provide the very important family's perspective on standardized developmental screening at well child visits. We'll start with that evidence behind this practice. Uh, then we will talk about the recommended developmental screening tools and coding. Uh, then I will hand the mic over to Rosalia, who will talk about her perspective as a parent. And then we will have Dr. Gillespie talk about his experience implementing standardized screening in his practice. So 20 percent of all visits to the pediatric clinician's office are developmentally or behavioral in nature. This is a very common presentation. And we also know that 80 percent of parental concerns are correct and accurate. It's not always clear exactly what the parent is, is describing to us, uh, but it's oftentimes more often than not, an accurate concern, and it becomes our clinical responsibility to tease out what is going on with that child's development or behavior. Children who fall behind in first grade have a one in eight chance of ever catching up. So they have a very small chance of, of catching up. So we want to intervene early so that they enter kindergarten on even foot with their, with their peers. And high school graduation rates can be accurately predicted by reading level at third grade. So we really want to intervene early. That's the take home message here. On why primary care as the site for standardized screening? Certainly standardized developmental screening can occur at many sites. Uh, we also know that over 90% of children do present to a primary care provider. So the catchment is, is quite impressive when we are looking at primary care offices as the place to implement standardized screening for all children. Uh, this is in comparison to less than half children actually attend a nursery or a preschool. So there are myths and there are true barriers that we also want to take into consideration when we are talking about a change in practice in what is already a very busy clinic. Uh, providers tell us that there's not enough time, so we want to make sure that we are recommending something that can be implemented in that busy practice. Uh, also, uh, providers sometimes feel that they know it when they see it. Uh, we know now that actually in looking back, uh, the majority of developmental delays are actually missed when using that subjective lens to look at that child's development. There is also a lingering reliance on homemade tools and checklists that are not standardized and therefore are not effective at picking up developmental delays early. There can be the practitioner's philosophy to wait and see. Uh, children do not resolve their developmental delays on their own. They, those developmental delays evolve into uh, oftentimes behavioral issues later on. So the intervening early is actually preventative. There is a true lack of knowledge of standardized tools and billing. And that's where START really jumps in and, and provides uh, what is needed to, to fulfill this, this gap. Uh, some of the tools, the ages and stages, for instance, uh, was not available at the time that uh, some of the more um, experienced practitioners were going through training and those, that knowledge can be gained uh, along with providing the tools to make that practice change. There are always literacy issues, both health literacy and a person's, a parent's ability to uh, be able to use the tool on their own. And so that's a very important aspect of implementation to take into consideration and how those parents will be supported to be able to complete the parent questionnaire. And there is the lack of knowledge of referral resources. Providers have been trained to anticipate what they would do in the case that an action should be taken when they do a screening. And knowing what can be done is very important to um, address that, that barrier for looking and, and uh, feeling like you wouldn't know what to do with those results. And START does use, when we go into clinics and provide trainings, we also bring in local community representatives to, from agencies 
that would logically be a resource for uh, responding to concerns. So developmental screening is very important in the overall care of our families. Uh, it, it does result in a higher family satisfaction that their concerns have been addressed and their child's development has been uh, looked at and assessed. Uh, so it, it's really also a part of the Oregon's parent-centered primary care home and metrics. It's also one of the coordinated care organizations' performance metrics that developmental screening be performed. It is the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement that screening should occur at 9 month, 18 month, and 30 or an alternate 24 month well child visit for all children coming in for routine care. And it is part of the Bright Futures guidelines. So we really have a coalescing of multiple sources agreeing that standardized developmental screening should occur in early childhood. When we look at the implementation of, of standardized screening as opposed to using that, that uh, previous checklist that has not been standardized, we see that we also uh, are seeing an increase in referrals. So we are seeing increased involvement of other agencies to assess that child's development and uh, intervene and provide interventions early to address the child's developmental delays. We also know evidence shows that early intervention programs, when implemented early, can improve IQ can improve motor skills, language, and ultimately academic achievement. It is an effective way to use our tax dollars for child development as well. The average total expenditure for child and early intervention is just short of $16,000. We also see that half of those children who receive early intervention graduate from the program and no longer need the services by three years of age. And we also know that an estimated cost of failing to provide intervention for children living in poverty specifically can be as high as $100,000. So what is screening? And how does screening fit within the context of surveillance and diagnosis? That's a very important um, concept that we want to look at. First, looking at surveillance. Surveillance is not screening. Surveillance is flexible, it's continuous rather than at specific points in time. It's our work involved in identifying family risk and family resilience. And it's our professional skills of observing that child uh, during a health child health care visit and in consulting with other professionals and caregivers. So I always think that surveillance is something that I really can't stop doing. I'm, I'm sort of doing surveillance when I'm in the grocery store uh, watching a family that I don't even know and looking at that child's development and behavior in that setting. So it's continuous. And it's really involving our professional uh, skills and experience to be able to assess uh, from our perspective how that family's risk and resilience are playing out for that child's development. The so surveillance uh, has five components. It's addressing, eliciting and addressing parents' concerns, uh, which, as we've already heard, can increase uh, uh, parent satisfaction in those visits. It's taking a developmental history. So here's where that checklist really can play a part. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not screening, but it is surveillance to check off a child's developmental milestones. It's, again, looking at family risk and the protective factors that play into and contribute to our ultimate clinical judgment. It's making those observations of that child while that child is in your office. And it's the documentation. Now, screening, on the other hand, is at particular points in time. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that all children receive standardized developmental screening at their nine-month well-child visit, 
and again at their 18 month and their 30 month or as an alternate to the 30 to 24 month. It is objective, so it's not that subjective uh, process that we do with surveillance, it's objective. And it's using a standardized tool so that it is horrible and easy to interpret. And it differentiates children that are probably okay versus those needing additional investigation. So it is not diagnostic. So what is diagnosis and evaluation? Diagnosis is the next step when screening identifies a child needing additional investigation. And it's done by a professional with expertise in doing developmental evaluation. It's aimed at identifying specific developmental disorders, so it's diagnostic. A child receives a diagnosis when they go through a developmental evaluation. And this is a very important point. While developmental screening can occur at many places and logically would capture many, many children at the medical clinic, it is it, it, when it is done in other places, it is very important that that person doing that developmental screening also connect that family and that child to a medical home because when we find a developmental delay, we may be seeing the tip of the iceberg of a, an underlying condition that is, is involved in and fun, fundamental to that child's developmental delay. And therefore, a child diagnosed with a developmental delay should receive a medical evaluation in their medical home by their medical provider primary care provider to assess the possible coexisting medical condition. For the benefits of screening, it, it is better patient care, it improves satisfaction, it provides earlier identification and referral. Uh, so it is actually prevention of other uh, issues, other uh, challenges academically and behavioral issues. It improves outcomes. It's reimbursable, it's cost effective, and it is the CCO and the PCPCH metrics. The advantages of using a parent-completed screening tool, standardized tool, is that it can help focus the visit on parental concerns. Um, those tools highlight the areas that are, are concerning and provide opportunities for parents to also provide specific concerns that they have that can focus that visit that's already packed with, with anticipatory guidance. It enhances teachable moments. It, uh, parents often say, I didn't know my child was supposed to be doing that when they're filling out the questionnaire. Sometimes parents also come back and say, I didn't think she was doing it, and when I went home tonight and she was doing it. So I think it really does influence and educate parents on child early childhood development and, and in, in enhances their lens at looking at their child's development. It can help avoid the, oh, by the way, questions as you're about ready to leave that that visit uh, so that those issues are addressed up front in the, in the clinic visit and not introduced by the parent in, in, um, in desperation as the, they realize the visit is ending. Uh, it can provide rich information about the child across settings. The parent really has that across settings perspective on their child's development as opposed to what is just going on in the clinic in the moment. It can actually improve patient flow, so that's a very important uh, consideration uh, when we're looking at implementing standardized screening and, and the concern that it may be burdensome to that visit. And again, it provides greater family satisfaction. So START has uh, moved toward facilitating practices to implement change in practice and, and, and use ages and stages questionnaire. Uh, we uh, find that um, many um, uh, practices, when given the choice, do end up using the ages, stages, and questionnaire, and this has been true for Oregon as well across the state. And it is effective, a, a, a standardized tool that is uh, um, uh, a powerful tool as seen by these characteristics of the questionnaire. It has high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, it can be Xerox after it is purchased and it is written at the fourth to sixth grade level. It only takes three minutes to score, and it is clear to interpret. So we want to prepare parents and caregivers on, on what it is. It's, it's 
standardized. It, it's applied to all children at the 9, 18, and 30 or 24 month well child visits. So it's not that we have a concern about the child's development. It's that we, this is the standard of practice for all children, and this is, should be normalized for parents. Just as you take the weight, always, not just when you have a concern about the child's weight, we do standardize developmental screening for all children at those visits. Here's an example of a couple of questions uh, from the nine-month questionnaire. Uh, and you see that it's very easy to respond to, yes, sometimes or not at all, and it's very easy to score. Uh, yes, gets 10, sometimes gets 5, and not at all, at, not yet, gets a 0. Okay. So I need to go back one slide. Um, okay, here we go. So uh, here is the scoring sheet. And so those scores, as they're tallied for each domain, and the Ages and Stages questionnaire has five domains there listed in the first column. Uh, then the bubbles are, are colored in. And you see here that if it's in the white, it's uh, not concern at this time, or the child's, uh, the child's development does appear to be on track. If it's in the gray zone, it means that it's 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. And if it's in the black zone, it's two standard deviations below the mean. And these scores, along with clinical judgment, determine referral. If a child is, is in the black zone for one or more developmental domains, then a child probably should be referred for further assessment. We have a common referral form that at the time of referral to typically an early intervention program or a public school system for assessment or diagnostic evaluation, uh, this elicits at the same time a parent's uh, 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 signed consent, both HIPAA and FERPA, so that we can assure that that communication loop is robust between the primary care practice making the referral, the parents, and the uh, organization that's doing the um, developmental assessment so that the communication could go back to the provider. Coding and documentation is also very important. The, the code 96110 is multi-purpose. It's not just for billing and may in some instances be uh, decided in a clinic to not bill for this, but simply to code for it. Coding 96110 when standardized developmental screening is done in primary care practice tracks screening rates and will be used for CCO and PCPCH uh, metrics. Uh, it, um, when, if you, in the process of deciding whether or not to actually bill for this service, it's important to consider all the pros and cons. This actually gets very complex very quickly, and I would refer those interested in considering this to look at the OPEP resource uh, that is available online uh, to begin that process of consideration. It's typically reported during those preventive service visits. Uh, it's important to, to that the medical provider discuss this with the parents, uh, the results of it with the parents. That's part of the requirement uh, for billing and certainly for uh, a high quality standard of care. It can, however, be uh, given to the parents by, uh, medic, by office staff. It can be scored by the physician, the nurse, or the medical assistant. And uh, it should be explained up front why it is being done uh, to the parents. And that can also be done by anyone in the office. It's important to document what tool was administered, what the results of those were, and interpretation of those results, and that it was discussed with the family. So it's important when the decision is made to bill, uh, it is important to bill for all um, um, patients and all health care coverages. This is, it, it cannot be billed for some and not for others. And this is true for uh, other practices as well. So 96110, CPT code, uh, says specifically developmental screening with interpretation and report per standardized instrument form. So it needs to be a standardized tool, and it needs to have all the documentation that's previously been described. 
if there uh, are multiple visits, uh, you can attach a modifier. You see that information there. Um, if the claim is rejected, uh, there is an American Academy of Pediatrics letter uh, that is available, one of the resources that will be available online. And that combined with the copy of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, guidelines uh, can be persuasive in assuring that you get reimbursed if you decide to bill for this service. So it's always important when you're delivering uh, the results of the standardized screening and your um, recommendation that a child receive a diagnostic evaluation to encourage communication and follow up on those referrals so that common referral form can facilitate that process as well as talking with the parents about the importance of keeping you as the medical provider in the loop in that process. Uh, having this conversation with the parent is very important because uh, otherwise it is, there's increased likelihood that the parents will not follow through with that referral. Uh, and it's important to schedule a um, um, uh, follow-up visit uh, to follow up on what the results of that assessment were. We also start, also can uh, provide training for clinics and we go into clinics and we provide uh, the, uh, the, the information on the tools, we provide a uh, quality improvement method for practice change using the Plan Do Study Act PDSA cycles over a nine month period to assure that uh, change occurs and the change that occurs is the change that you anticipated uh, would happen. Uh, so I, at this point, am going to hand the microphone over to uh, Rosalia who is a parent who has a young child who has received standardized screening and, and um, hear her story about what that experience is, nice, is like for, for her and her child. So Rosalia, thank you very much for coming here today. I, my pleasure, my pleasure. Okay. Um, so um, what was your experience with your child? How, how old is your child, and what was your, ex your, your experience with your child's developmental screening in the doctor's office? Uh, I have a very robust two-year-old son. Um, and um, I had a, a very positive experience with developmental screening um, in my son's doctor's office. I completed the ASQ at my son's 9 and 18-month uh, well-child visit. Um, and at the nine-month visit, um, the, my son's provider reviewed the tool prior to coming into the room, and so then she delivered the results um, during the visit. And um, we didn't talk comprehensively about the tool, um, but in the 18-month visit, however, I found the ASQ incredibly helpful because uh, my son had um, not yet met several milestones um, in the area of communication. And I was able to point to specific items in the tool and say, do you see this? I'm, uh, he's, he's behind in this area. And I really found it as a very positive um, tool to be able to validate my concerns and, and also better articulate the areas that um, I felt he was a little behind in. Um, ultimately, my son's score didn't result in one that was overly alarming, so the provider I uh, really just suggested a, a watch and wait uh, approach. So I, I'm hearing that um, that you were very involved in the process and, and you kind of used the questionnaire as, as your sounding board for... I, I did, especially in that 18-month um, visit. Um, I, yeah, great. Great, that's, that's wonderful. And so what feedback do you have for doctors? Um, well, I think the first area of feedback I had is um, I had the benefit of being uh, aware of what the ASQ was, but uh, some supplemental information when I received it at the doctor's office would have been helpful to tell me what it was that I was filling out and why and how long it was going to take. Uh, I uh, was just handed the screener and said, oh, please fill this out. And um, I actually watched other parents in the waiting room kind of look at it a little confused about what it also was that they were filling out. And so th that information would have been uh, really helpful. Um, another area of feedback would be um, to take the time to talk about the tool and the various domains in the tool with the parent, even if uh, a child has a typical development. I think that's 
it can be used as a really wonderful teaching opportunity to go through the tool and talk about a, a, their, a child's development with a parent. Um, and then the, the other area is uh, just saying watch and wait is sometimes very alarming to a parent um, or come back in three months. I mean, that three months can really seem like an eternity to, to us when we spend you know, every moment with our child and we're so overly concerned about you know, how they are in terms of their development and behavior. Um, and so giving us um, an activity, or I know the AS2 comes with several of activity resource sheets would have been really helpful. It helps actually to empower us as parents to uh, monitor our child's development. It kind of puts it back in our hands. Um, and then the, the, my last area of feedback, I know I have a lot of feedback, <laughs> would be um, it, it just an administrative component. Um, you know, asking us to come 15 minutes early sometimes isn't enough time to fill out uh, the tool. It it, the tool it, is, is long. It takes it, the questions take a lot of thoughtfulness or time with our kids. Sometimes we have more than one child at the visit. And so um, either sending it to us in the mail or uh, building more time into the visit so we can complete the tool would be really helpful. Oh, those are great suggestions. So I'm hearing the overall message is that that your child's development is an important issue for you, and and Absolutely. and you you feel like it it's worthy of ded a dedicated time, and that and kind of giving a context from the very beginning at the front desk when you get the questionnaire and talking about it, even when as a medical provider we see there are no issues. Right. And right. Because even if there are issues or some very minor issues early on, it, it kind of turns on for us as a parent to start looking at those things and monitoring them. And like I said, it empowers us to take that back. Great, great. So that's that's a very that's a very interesting message that uh, standardized developmental screening can actually empower parents to, yeah, to be more involved and, and and educated about their child's development. So what would you like to say to other parents about the developmental screening process? Um, well, with all that I said about the importance of screening and, and monitoring development, um, you know, just from my own experience with my child, every child grows and develops at their own pace. So even if they're behind in parts of the ASQ, for example, it doesn't mean that that's ultimately going to result in any kind of diagnosis. But with that said, the the developmental screening uh, really presents a wonderful opportunity for us as parents to have a tool to monitor our child's development. And also, it allowed me personally to um, better validate my concerns when I was talking with my son's provider. Um, and then uh, I, I would just like to go back to the empowerment. And it, as a parent, if, if you have concerns about your child's development, there are a lot of great online tools. Uh, the ASQ Oregon allows you to fill out the ASQ online. And that allows you to do that monitoring in between low child visits. And then you can take that back to your provider for further discussion. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. That Your perspective as a parent is, is very valuable for, for all of us. And I really appreciate you sharing your great ideas with us today. Great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. OK. So now I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie is a general pediatrician at the Children's Clinic here in Portland, Oregon. His clinic is one of the first to participate in START trainings and to implement standardized developmental screening. So Dr. Gillespie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so, so your clinic has really been a champion in delivery of pediatric care and the use of standardized developmental screening at those 9, 18, and 30-month well-child visits as recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, what did your clinic do before implementing standardized developmental screening? Well, before implementing standardized screening, we were doing surveillance at every well visit that was based loosely on milestones from the Denver. Uh, and we asked those questions um, as a series of yes-no questions during the well visits. Um, so at the time, we didn't really have a formal way to dive deeper into developmental concerns if they were raised by the family or if the provider had specific concerns. So what that meant is that oftentimes developmental concerns were either treated with a watch and wait approach 
or we would refer directly into specific services, but there wasn't any actual data to back up the decisions that were being made uh, at the office visit. Oh, okay. So, so you, you, you in, certainly in retrospect, you saw um, some uh, areas for opportunities for um, improvement on detection and, and in child development. But why did you want to make a change? That's a big decision. And, and did everyone agree? Or were there were some in, who were reluctant? And how, if so, did you manage that? Uh, I think after reading the guidelines from the AAP, it was pretty clear that we were missing some opportunities to identify children with developmental delays, particularly the more subtle delays. Um, we weren't asking parents specifically if they had questions uh, about their child's development other than the general what questions do you have prompt at the beginning of the visit. And so our developmental surveillance wasn't really specific enough to accurately identify kids who needed services. And at the time, we weren't really utilizing a lot of the community-based services um, or resources like early intervention very consistently. I, I think um, that everybody in the practice was aware of the guidelines, and so no one in the practice was really resistant to the idea of doing developmental screening per se, but a lot of the providers had a hard time thinking about how to actually make screening happen in their daily practice. And I think that was the piece that was really missing from the AAP guidelines. We all understood from reading the guidelines the why question in terms of why you need to do developmental screening, but not the how question in terms of how to actually make that work in a daily practice. You, yeah, you bring up a very good point, and that is, you know, we have all of this knowledge in our heads, and how we actually translate that into change in practice, or practice and change in practices, is another um, uh, facet of, of the work that we do. So what barriers did you anticipate before beginning change, and how did you address those? Well, I think the workflow was really the big issue and concerns about how much time that was going to take in a visit. Um, you know, in primary care practice, we're on a very rapid pace. We're seeing patient after patient after patient. We didn't want to implement something that was going to um, significantly disrupt our, our, our workflow. And I think that, that when we developed the START curriculum and training, that was a major goal of the program, to really break down the components of the workflow into manageable pieces to aid in the uptake of developmental screening. I think one of the, the most important key factors in our practice, though, was, was really addressing the workflow issue by having one or two providers who are willing to champion the process, have them try it out for a few weeks, and work out the kinks in the system before the rest of the practice jumped on board. So before we trained the entire practice in developmental screening, I actually started screening a few months ahead of time so that I could actually accurately describe what it was like. It turned out it didn't take that much time at all, but I think having um, that sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, this is what the process actually feels like and how the, the, the flow of the visit actually goes was, was very important in terms of, of sort of overcoming some of the, um, the, the barriers to, to implementing screening. Good points. I'm hearing you uh, say that you approached it in small steps and, and learning from those steps uh, as you began to broaden uh, the implementation. So what would start's role in the process? Well, we decided that if we were going to do developmental screening that we were going to go by the books in terms of doing all the recommended ages. Um, we had some conversation um, in, the, in the practice uh, about whether we start just at one age, like the nine-month visit, which would, again, go back into the um, the small tests of change, um, but then to, and then adding on other ages later. But we decided that if we could work out the workflow problems on one visit, then the other visits were going were to be the same. So once you figure out the workflow, you figured it out for for all the ages. Um, so when we did all um, we did all three recommended age visits, um, so the nine, eighteen, and twenty four months at the same time. Um, at the time, we weren't getting reimbursed for 30-month visits, so we did the screening of the 24 months instead, but now we are getting reimbursed for 30-month visits, so we've swapped that out so that we're doing the, uh, the screening at the 30-month visit instead. Um, and we also implemented screening for autism at the same time, so we bit off a pretty big chunk of practice change all at once. Um, so we used one of our existing journal club meeting times to conduct the START training. Um, and I think that, that what START brought to that, you know, obviously is one of the original trainers of START, I wanted to make sure that I could sell this kind of screening to my practice. Um, and, and the important parts that START brought were, number one, breaking down the workflow into, into manageable chunks. This is how you actually think through a workflow change. But also, I think the providers really appreciated the chance to meet the community resources 
and to spend time thinking about how the workflow would map out in our practice. So that to start provided that bigger scope of, of uh, what how the whole process from beginning to referral occurs and as well as some of the uh, internal PDSA cycles and iterations for practice change as well. Absolutely, and really the, the, the map the workflow section of the start training, really it, it, it does, it, it takes you through step by step what happens when a, when a parent walks into the office, how does the screen get put in their hands, who collects it, who scores it, how does it get into the hands of the provider, how do you remember to talk about it in the visit, all those little nuts and bolts kind of issues, you know, who's responsible for making sure there are copies of the screen available when people check in, all those kind of little details that you have to think through to make a workflow happen, that was all part of, of the training. There's a, a section specifically on that. Great, great. And I'm hearing some overlap with uh, Rosalia's perspective as a parent and, and being the consumer of that process. Uh, it's, it, this, is, this is very interesting to hear a different, two different perspectives. So in retrospect, what was most challenging in the process of changing how your clinic monitored your patient's development, and how did you overcome those? Um, I think that the thing that I wish I'd done differently um, is um, following up with the providers about how screening was going and whether the screens were easy for them to implement and what challenges they were having as we went along. Um, at, at the time um, that we did the STAR training, um, START wasn't connected with maintenance and certification, um, but once that was added in, um, the clinic started doing chart reviews for the maintenance and certification credits. And then once we shared those results with the providers, we started having a lot more conversations about how the pr process was actually going. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I, I heard consistently from some of the providers, and it was originally they framed it as a complaint, and I ended up sort of framing it more as a strength, but they, they complained that they felt like they were having longer conversations about development than they would have had without the screening tool. Um, and I think that that was, um, a reframing thing that I, I talked to them about how important that conversation really was for a child's long-term health trajectory and that one of the misperceptions about developmental screening tools is that if the results are normal your conversation about development is done um, but I think that the, the ASQ and the other developmental screening tools are really meant to be a springboard into conversations about normal development about opportunities to promote the child's development and also to address the parent concerns about their child's development uh, and now we've been screening for well over five years, and there isn't a provider in the practice that would go back at this point because I think everybody's really seeing the value in what we're doing. And we started hearing back from patients about how much they valued the, the process as well, and I think that really reinforced um, those initial challenges that we were having. Well, it's exciting to hear how, how, how similar your in insight into this process is with Rosalia as a parent and, and completely different perspectives, but really focused on the same thing and, and the importance and value placed on early childhood development. That's, and the evidence behind it also supports that. Um, so where are you today in regard to screening? Uh, we've actually implemented a lot of other screening tools since then, and I think that start training in terms of really breaking down the workflow was the first step into, uh, into being able to do some other screenings. I, I think one of the, the big challenges of medical home is kind of getting out of your health-centric model of, of care delivery and getting a lot more into sort of the family dynamic and the family structure. And so some of the things that we've implemented since then are screening tools for postpartum depression. Um, we use screening tools for adolescent substance abuse and adolescent depression. Uh, we use the Vanderbilt ADHD scales for diagnosis and monitoring of ADHD. We've been doing um, screening for adverse childhood experiences and screening for special health care needs to help get um, a better idea of our population of children with special health care needs to do population management um, for, for those patients that do have more complicated health needs. Uh, again, once we had implemented one screening tool, the other tools are really simple to implement. We had the workflow down. So it was just a matter of learning the new tools in terms of how to implement and interpret the tools themselves. And I think it's gotten to the point where our patients are used to going through the questionnaires before visits, and so they're engaged. They're able to get the tools done relatively quickly. 
And I think in the end it makes the visits go much more efficiently because it helps the family to focus their thoughts, questions, and needs, and then helps the pri provider to help prioritize what needs to be discussed during a visit. Um, and totally, I think the families have been very happy with the different screening tools. The one that I, I tended to get the most conversation about were the, the autism screening tools because there's so much concern in the public press about autism that the families were really uh, relieved they were looking into those, um, that particular issue. Um, developmental screening has been much the same way where, where people are, are reassured if things are going well and validated if they have concerns. Well, that's really powerful messages, uh, Dr. Gillespie. Um, so I'm hearing in this case that that uh, the process of practice change has been generalized and applied to other instances. At the same time, this whole process of screening has pulled in parents as advocates uh, for their children. That's, 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 those are wonderful outcomes. So I'm excited to hear what is on the horizon for your practice. Well, right now the thing we're focusing on the most um, is the screening for adverse childhood experiences. That's our most recent endeavor. We have a lot of work still to do in that area. Um, right now what we're doing is screening parents for their own adverse childhood experiences so that we can understand which families might benefit from more focused counseling on parenting, discipline, appropriate developmental expectations for the children, and so forth. Um, it's a fairly untested process, so we're using what we learned in developmental screening workflows to decide how to best incorporate this process into our practice. And I think so far the families are responding well. Um, but part of that is after doing a lot of screening for developmental delays and maternal depressions, I think, again, our families are more aware that we're, we as providers are really in it to help families get what they need. And so I think they're, they feel less threatened by what otherwise might seem like fairly personal questions. Um, and so that's really where we're headed is diving again deeper into the family dynamics to help understand um, uh, the, the factors that might influence a child's development. I think that, that um, it, it's fairly obvious but still is an aha moment when you realize that children don't develop in a vacuum and that without a stable functioning family, their development and health can't, um, can't progress in a normal way. And so getting into those family dynamics is really where we're focusing a lot of our effort. Wow. Once again, it's your, you, uh, you and your clinic are such champions and trailblazers in this process. Uh, and, and, and this process has not only uh, resulted in practice change, but has also brought in uh, parents' uh, increased trust and understanding of, of uh, how this all plays out to uh, positively contribute to their child's optimal development. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillespie, for joining us today. This, your perspective and, and children's clinic is, is, uh, is very helpful in understanding what this, what this means and, and how this can improve um, uh, outcomes for children. Absolutely. Happy to participate. So in closing, uh, uh, START does do uh, the quality improvement uh, process of the uh, Plan, Do, Study, Act, PDSA cycle for practice change uh, to assure that the uh, standard of care for children is um, uh, high in Oregon or across the state. Uh, we also have training specific in addition to the basic developmental screening in the areas of autism, postpartum depression, as Dr. Gillespie had mentioned, uh, social emotional development, adolescent depression, and there are more on the horizon. When a clinic participates in the training, they do receive continuing medical education and pediatricians can uh, receive their maintenance of certification part four for uh, their um, uh, board certification as well. Uh, if there are any questions uh, regarding uh, participation in START, uh, they can refer to Peg King, whose contact information is below. So thank you very much. I um, am quite excited uh, to be here today and, and very pleased uh, to have had Rosalia and Dr. Gillespie uh, in this process of uh, laying out the importance of standardized developmental screening, and um, practice change in primary care.
Great. Thank you so much. This is this is Kate again. So just want to encourage people to type type away and provide us with your questions. Um, we did have one question come in already, and that was, did Dr. Gillespie find that implementation of both the ASQ and MCHAT created too much at once? Can you use the MCHAT as an escalation tool rather than giving parents both at one time? You know, we, we've considered that, and, and you know, at the, if the doing both at the same time does make the 18-month visit a little bit heavy. But um, adding the 30-month visit um, did help us with that because then we do the, the second um, MCHAT at the 24-month visit and then the 30-month the ASQ ends up being separated out. Um, you, you know, there's, there's been some, some research looking into whether you need to do both, and so far the research isn't saying that the ASQ can definitely detect autism, but I have not yet seen a child who had an abnormal MCHAT and a normal ASQ. Um, they're kind of both abnormal at the same time. Um, but to get to the, um, the question about time, um, we've just sort of gritted our teeth and, and dealt with it. Um, so the 18-month visit does end up being a little bit heavier, uh, but we also have timed our vaccine so that we don't do shots at the 18-month visit so that we can really spend the visit just focusing on the developmental stuff. And so that helps with the time issue because we've taken off the pressure of, of, of having to talk about vaccines at that visit. So we have our kids doing their, their shots at the 15-month visit to kind of accommodate that. And we've done a similar thing with a nine-month visit where, you know, unless it's flu season, you really don't have any shots at the nine-month visit either so that we can really focus those two visits on the developmental questionnaires and on the MCHAT. So overall, it hasn't been a big issue. Um, it's a little bit of an issue. All right, thanks. And then um, was there anyone else that, I don't know if Dr. Alderman, if you had any other thoughts on that one before we move on to the next question? Oh, and then um, there was a question about repeating the num repeat the visits you do the ASQs at. So right now we're doing them at 9, 18, and 30 months uh, because with, um, uh, with the health reform changes, we're now getting reimbursed for a 30-month visit, so we, we do the questionnaire at the 30-month. At the okay. All right, and if there are any other questions, if you can type them into your questions pane, that would be wonderful. So what do you do, one other question is, what do you do if results are borderline? Uh, for me, that depends. Um, if it's one area that's borderline, then I'll usually retest them at the next visit. If it's a couple areas that are borderline, I'll um, um, make a decision whether I need to see them sooner or whether I need to refer them into services. And part of that decision comes from the conversation with the family. And, and so I think that's part of where the art of medicine comes in, is deciding is this child having good opportunities to have their development stimulated? Um, are the parents um, uh, kind of understanding the things that they, they need to do and what their role is in, in stimulating their child's development? And if I feel iffy about it, then I, I send them on to services. If I feel like um, families have a good, a, a good handle on how to how to stimulate development, then, then I'll retest them at the next visit. But with the ages and stages questionnaire, there is also um, a resource uh, that are activities that uh, sheep that are age specific and um, domain specific that you can give to the families to give them ideas about how to stimulate the child's development. So in either case, I end up retesting, and I, and I always give them these resources of here's some ideas of games you can play to stimulate those particular domains. Um, but depending on, I think, what um, my assessment of the family's capacity, I may refer them in even for a borderline if I feel like there's some question about how, um, uh, how the family is going to be able to support a child that, that has a borderline result. And if I could add to that, um, on it, the, the standardized developmental screening is not intended to replace clinical judgment. I don't think anyone believes that, but it really does facilitate uh, clinical judgment. If a child scores 
uh, concerning and needing a referral and that parent is not yet ready to take that next step, keeping that parent involved in, in conversation and engaged in the process and as Dr. Gillespie says, following up sooner than the next routine visit to look again at that child's development can help walk that parent through the process um, and when they are not yet ready to jump on board with a developmental assessment. And that's also, as, as Dr. Gillespie alluded to, uh, a, a fine time to bring in all of those results of that surveillance that you've been gathering and the risk and resilience in that family as well in, in contributing to your clinical judgment. So in, in short, the results of the screening uh, do not dictate what you do. They help facilitate your clinical judgment, and you can uh, not immediately refer if the child scores concerning. You can refer if the child does not score concerning because your clinical judgment uh, indicates that a child should get a developmental assessment, or you can uh, titrate that conversation with the family, keeping them engaged, and over time, uh, bring them across that um, uh, from the standardized screening results to assessment. Great. So we have um, three more questions that came in. The first was, are you mailing the ASQ to parents or giving it at the visit? How do you address if the parent doesn't complete the form at the visit? Uh, we give ours out at the visit. Um, you know, the, the response rate on mailed surveys is is pretty poor. You probably get a third uh, in a good circumstance uh, of people doing it and, and bringing it in with them. Uh, if, if the tool is not completed at the time of the visit, that again is sort of a, a decision point for me. Is it just that they haven't had enough time or did they not know that it was important to me or um, are they having trouble filling out the tool? And so if they're having trouble filling out the tool, I'll often run through the parts for them because sometimes um, you know you can administer the questionnaire as a as an interview for somebody whose whose reading skills are not great or whose language skills are not great um, and and get where you need to go. Um, otherwise, what I'll often do if the questionnaire is not filled out is uh, you know I'll do the rest of my exam and I'll I'll say I want to have a conversation about this screening tool. So why don't you take a few more minutes? to fill it out and I'll come back and I'll, I'll go do something else for a few minutes and then come back in um, and talk about the screening tool. Um, it sort of depends on, on how fast your, your clinic flow is, whether you give parents enough time to, to fill out questionnaires. If you happen to be on time or early all the time, then they're not going to have as much opportunity. But typically what I'll do is give them a few more minutes and then um, loop back around once they finish the tool. Great. There was another question um, about whether you scan the completed form into the electronic medical record. Um, for our charting, I'm on Centricity, and, and we have actually built scoring forms into our um, uh, EMR so that we document the results, but not the entire tool gets scanned in. Um, however, um, as long as we're on the subject, usually when we refer somebody to early intervention, I do send the entire tool to early intervention along with the referral. So we've actually built specific um, uh, scoring uh, templates into our electronic medical record. And part of the reason for doing that is that as you're going through the flow of the visit, the ASQ scoring form pops up every time before you get to your physical exam on the 9, 18, and 30-month visits. And so it serves as a decision, re uh, decision support to remind the providers that this is an age that it's supposed to be done. So if you don't have it in your hands for some reason, then you need to figure out where it is. Um, but we don't scan the whole thing into our EMR because we have that other way of documenting. Okay, so we Can have I one minute and one more question, if I could just get that one. Or did, was there something else? And I was just going to add really quickly that that uh, most practices are uh, scanning just the score sheet into uh, their electronic medical records and uh, giving the questionnaire, completed questionnaire, back to the parents. As a developmental pediatrician, I really appreciate receiving the full questionnaire um, so that I can delve deeper and have a clearer picture of the child's presentation uh, when I begin to do a developmental assessment. 
Okay, so there's one other question. Why ASQ versus, it's either PEDS or PEDS or PEDSDM. The acronyms are tripping me up, but if one of you could speak to why that screening tool specifically. The, there were actually um, two reasons. One is that um, the PEDS, actually the sensitivity and specificity are not as good. And the other is that um, the ASQ um, aligns with how early intervention does their assessment. So the, the ages and stages questionnaire um, has been uh, what early intervention does as their first step. And so it, it sort of uh, aligns with, with early intervention in terms of their evaluation process. Um, but I, I find the tool to be um, a lot more specific and a better teaching tool in terms of, of what specific um, skills a child should have at any particular age. The PEDS um, basically is a series of questions that ask, um, do you have any concerns about how your child uh, moves, for example, but it doesn't get into at nine months a child should be doing these gross motor skills. Um, so it's a better teaching tool for me in terms of, of my clinical practice than, than the PEDS. Uh, yes, and uh, if I could just add, it, Dr. Gillespie is right. It is it is had, the ages and stages questionnaire has specific developmental domains, and as we heard from Rosalia, as a parent, it really identifies specific skills that a child should have at particular ages, uh, and it and it can be a great um, uh, teaching tool. It it does look at development directly. Uh, the PEDS technically is el eliciting parental concerns, which, which as we've heard, is, is also a, a, a valid approach, uh, just not to the level of detail that the Ages and Stages questionnaire is. All right, so we are at 9.01, and I'm sure everyone has a morning to get off and, and work on. So um, there are some resources that, are, um, that were mentioned throughout the webinar that will be attached to the webinar page. Um, along with a PDF version of the slides, and then the recording of this webinar will be posted to pcpci.org uh, by the end of the day today. There is a webinar survey. We'd really love it if you could complete that before moving on to the rest of your day. I want to thank our presenters, Drs. Alderman and Gillespie and Rosalia, for um, getting on the phone and the web to share such great information with us today. And thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you all.